Uh, good evening, friends. Uh, it's it's truly you know remarkable that at at this point of time uh, you know we know Money Life Foundation. First, I became a member. Then we I was invited on their board, and now since I have you know founded. Uh, a legal international legal alliance basically which is a network of lawyers internationally uh, we are all uh, using the sort of the the net to be virtual and to be in touch with each other we started very small we were just about 15 or 20 of us and now we have at least one lawyer or law firm in um, i think 151 countries we're not allowed to advertise so a lot of people don't know about us which is fine <laughs> the uh, whole aim and objective is that you should be able to interact with colleagues not only within india but even even outside and and on a lot of these subjects including the subject that we're going to talk about today we have had very interesting discussions i mean i've been able to appear in in matters outside of india which have a lot of relevance to what is happening today so uh, and you know thank you very much mihir for making uh, uh, you know you are able to come today and and discuss this at a level because i think today uh, a lot of us whether it's lawyers journalists activists each one of us are faced with this ignominy of saying if if you go to court or you you know do something which is slightly out of the ordinary you are sort of asked or you are threatened with the following so i think but it's very important for us to understand what all these subjects are and how we can actually uh, defend it and defend it fearlessly so may i request me here to Uh, thank you, Money Life Foundation. Thanks, Jamshed. Uh, Money Life Foundation, especially, is uh, not a novice to defamation lit litigation. They face uh, litigation and they've come out successfully from it, which is one of those uh, uh, few remarkable achievements in defamation law, as far as activists go. But it has been a. Uh, it was an. Extremely, uh, it's something from which uh, we all learned the judgment and the way they went about uh, handling the case. The two topics on which I am going to talk about today, defamation and contempt of court, these are the two topics. Basically, broad, they are, uh, they are very vast topics and it's very difficult to, uh, you know, discuss threadbare about them in the limited time that we have but i will try to give a broad overview from the point of view of uh, journalists and from the point of view of activists as to what does these what do these laws say and what are the things how the judiciary has reacted to it and what are the things one has to be cautious about one has to be careful about and one has to be careless about so you know uh, we need to have a clear idea of what these laws are. Both these laws, whether you look at contempt or you look at defamation, are seen as an exception to the fundamental right of freedom of speech and expression. They are seen as an exception because uh, Article 19, which talks of fundamental rights and fundamental right of speech and expression, there is uh, an exception carved out that yes, everybody has freedom of speech and expression, but there are certain things in respect of which the government can the, uh, can make law to restrain that right. So security of state, law and order, etc. And uh, defamation and contempt of court are specifically mentioned there. Now, let me first talk about defamation because uh, as they say that i mean what is defamation in a common pal i think there is a lot of confusion about what is defamation first thing we must understand is that uh, is that if you abuse me in a private room okay when nobody else is there you abuse me in the choicest of words, etc., etc. Okay. 
it does not amount to defamation. Defamation is lowering the reputation of I, I, uh, lowering the reputation of somebody in the eyes of another person. Okay, so abusing me in front of me it doesn't amount to defamation, but abusing me in front of somebody else, okay, even whether whether I am present or not, may amount to defamation depending on what you are saying about uh, uh, what are the words used, what is the context, etc., etc. So a third person. To whom this is communicated, whatever is, whatever is the uh, lowering of reputation, whatever words are used, okay, becomes very important in defamation. That there is a third person involved. Okay. The other thing which is important about defamation law is uh, traditionally two kinds of defamations have been. I mean, defamation is divided in two kinds of defamations. One is slander, and second is libel. Okay. Written. And uh, I mean oral and written okay? uh, defamation. Uh, one is called slander. One is called libel. Okay? Also, if you look at the law, okay, the remedy for defamation, namely, suppose somebody defames me, what do I do? Okay? Right now, I'm talking from the point of view of the victim. Then we'll come to the point of view of journalists and activists, etc. But suppose somebody defames me, what do I do? Okay? Legally. Okay? Legally, I can either file a civil case or I can file a criminal case or I can file both. As far as civil cases go for defamation, you can, up, you can ask for damages, namely that I have been defamed, my, uh, my reputation has been lowered and therefore I am. Uh, I, I. I need to be compensated in terms of money for so many, uh, so many lakhs or crores of rupees, etc. So that's one thing you can ask for. And the second thing, the victim can ask for, is that an injunction should be granted against that person, a repeating what he or she has said in public, b. Especially with the uh, with uh, with uh, the social media and all that taking off, you know, see, if I, it's oral, if I made an oral statement, then preventing me from repeating is fine. But if it's something written, if it's come, if it comes in newspaper, you can injure me from repeating it. But if it's on social media, suppose it's on a website, a web portal, something like that, then the injunction is also. For removing that from the website, okay. So you have three kinds of remedies basically uh, within the civil law, which you talk about: that uh, injunction, damages, and uh, going back to the situation before the defamation occurred by taking taking off things from the media, etc., from the from the portal, etc. So this is one thing. The second thing is the criminal one, okay. Uh, criminal defamation under section 499-500 of the uh, Indian Penal Code, defamation is a crime, okay? but it's a personal crime. Normally the notion of crime is that the crime is against society. So what you do is you lodge a first information report in a police station and then the state takes over the litigation. Suppose somebody, suppose a theft is committed in your house. You are not prosecuting the case in court. It's the state which prosecutes case on your behalf because it's supposed to be a crime against society. Criminal defamation on the other hand is looked at as a personal crime. So the state will not prosecute unless the allegations are against persons who are occupying positions in the state. Otherwise, in a private, you defame me, it's a criminal offense. But when I go to court, I file a private complaint. I don't lodge an FIR for the state to prosecute. Okay? So that's, uh, that's how, and the maximum punishment is two years imprisonment if you are found guilty. A lot of countries have done away with criminal defamation. A lot of countries feel that it should not be a criminal offense. It, civil offense is fine, it's okay, but it's not something for which people should be put behind bars for defaming. 
A lot of countries have done away with criminal defamation. So cases were filed in Indian Supreme Court also very recently, some some few years back. The main case was filed by Mr. Subramanyam Swami, uh, saying that criminal defamation as a criminal offence is unconstitutional and should be done away with. Yeah. But the Supreme Court did not agree, and Supreme Court said that uh, uh, in uh, within certain restricted uh, sphere. Criminal defamation as a criminal offence can continue on the law books and can be used against people. Now, the reason why many people have uh, opposed defamation is I'll just give you two or three example examples of criminal and then civil defamation. There was a case. Uh, there was an article written in a. Marathi paper uh, concerning Swadhyay uh, organization, which is uh, which is run by uh, uh, I think Pandurang Pandurang Shastri Athore. Okay. Now that case, that was a case which was uh, 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 basically there were some remarks against Pandurang Shastri Athore and one person called Didi. Okay. Uh, so there were there were there were very very strong statements used in that uh, in that case. Uh, strong words used. No, I had thanks. Uh, strong strong words used. Now neither Didi nor Pandurang Shastri Athole filed any case. Okay. Cases were filed by those who belong to the Swadhyay Parivar as they call it. Okay. And about uh, some 37 cases were filed. Uh, because defamation, remember one thing, uh, the reason why it can be used to harass is not just because somebody can file a case against you, but somebody can file a case anywhere in the country against you. For instance, if something comes in a newspaper, the Times of India publishes something, I can say that I read it in Gauhati, though it pertains to my activities in Bombay, and I am in Bombay. Somebody, I mean, uh, everybody is in Bombay. Somebody read it in Gauhati, so I have been defamed in Gauhati, so I'll go and file a case in Gauhati. Okay? So, uh, th that is one reason why it, uh, criminal defamation can be used to harass people. Okay? Because uh, the uh, case can be filed anywhere. Okay? The second thing is, and this was being done till this this judgment came, but it is also being done now. But I'll tell you what happened here. That so a lot of these anuyayis of uh, Swadhyay, uh, the members of the Swadhyay Parivar filed cases across Maharashtra against this person uh, who had written the article. But the High Court quashed these cases, saying that look, defamation is a personal wrong. In the sense that, giving you an example, if you say that all lawyers are corrupt, okay, it won't amount to defamation, though it may be correct. Okay, what will amount to defamation is if you say that Mihir Desai is corrupt and you are not able to prove it. Okay, this is how the law works. That it has to be. It is a personal wrong. So the High Court set aside this. Uh, uh, these cases, criminal defamation cases, which were filed across the across board, and said that you cannot, uh, uh, you can, uh, uh, only Pandurang Shastri Athaule, if he felt he was defamed, or the DD who felt he or she was defamed, could have filed cases. Other people can't say we have been defamed because Pandurang Shastri Athaule or Swadhyay has been defamed because Swadhyay is an is not even a registered body or anything, so anybody can claim to be a member. So that was caused. Similarly, just three days back, I had a case uh, of a person called Anjali Damania. Now, Anjali Damania uh, uh, normally uh, is active in uh, cases of, in various cases, including cases of disproportionate asset by ministers, etc., etc. So she had made, uh, uh, she has filed a PIL. Uh, in which notices have been issued against, in respect of disproportionate assets of a ex-minister of the present government. Yeah. She also took press conference. 
So 21 cases were filed against her in Maharashtra and she was going on a Maharashtra Darshan because everybody issues processes etc 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 and it, it's complete harassment. Okay, Everybody filed, I mean people, uh, the, the cases were filed in the name of the party at various places. Okay, So we approached the court, right now it's at a nascent stage but we managed to get a stay order Okay, saying that uh, no, no steps, no coercive steps to be taken in respect of all these cases till such time as we hear the matter etc etc. The point I'm trying to make is that it, uh, the, uh, the criminal defamation, while now we don't have much of a choice in the sense that it has been upheld by the Supreme Court, is something which is used for harassing people okay, quite a lot. It may have been used in genuine cases also, I'm sure, but a lot of it is being used for harassing people. Okay. I, a similar thing happened with uh, the, the editor of Tehelka magazine, etc., etc., who was also, uh, I mean, who, who wrote an article in Delhi, sitting in Delhi, somebody in, uh, somebody somewhere in uh, Sholapur, etc., filed case, another person filed case somewhere else, third person filed case somewhere else. So, uh, uh, this is something which, uh, you know, has a chilling effect on people because you write something and somebody's sensitivities get affected and you may be able to prove yourself innocent at the end of the day but remember criminal the courts in india the process itself can really try and fr frustrate you out okay? ultimately you may win you may lose nothing may happen that's a separate issue but the process itself can be tiring out and this that, that is what happens with the criminal defamation process now, and remember one thing, that in criminal as well as in civil defamation, what has to be, what is permitted and what is not, okay, is something which we have to be clear about. That you are permitted to write something, even say as a journalist or as an activist, you are permitted to write something okay, and even criticize somebody As long as it is seen as a fair comment, it doesn't have to be truth. It may be truth, it may not be truth. Okay? But it has to be a fair comment, it has to be a studied comment. You, may, you can come to your own conclusion and arrive at, a, arrive, arrive at the decision and, and publish it. True, uh, uh, what you have to uh, prove is justification, not truth. That I was justifying uh, coming to this conclusion because of whatever I read. Second aspect about, so that's one thing, that fair comment. You also have to keep in mind now with the privacy regiment, which is very, very strong, especially after Puthuswami's uh, judgment. Where, where, because on the one hand you have a right to privacy, on the on the other hand you have a right to publish something about somebody in in press. Okay, so you have the, those two rights which compete in a sense with each other. Okay? Now, when you are talking about uh, so so, for instance, uh, even if you write, suppose your next door neighbor, your next door neighbor is a sex worker. Okay. You may be truthful in publishing that she is a sex worker. But you need to show something more. That it was in public interest to, uh, to bring this out. Otherwise you are violating her right to privacy. Okay. So what happens is that it's not enough that you are, it, uh, it's not necessarily that you are truth, truthful, but it's also not enough that you are truthful. Okay. You have to be truthful, I mean, to the extent you can, on the basis of this thing. But merely, you can't go around going into people's bedrooms and writing things okay, which have no relevance to public interest. Okay. So, uh, you have to, uh, so, uh, so uh, you can talk about issues. This, uh, you see, a similar thing had happened in uh, uh, a case which is... Uh, Famously known, uh, known, I mean, it's called Rangarajan's case, but it's uh, famously known as Otto Shankar's case. Now, this Otto Shankar was undergoing life imprisonment, I, I think death sentence, uh, for being a serial killer. Okay? And he wanted to publish a book. 
and a series of articles yeah, on a certain government servants yeah, and about their corruption or whatever other aspects. So there the matter went up to Supreme Court because those government servants went to the court saying they don't allow him to publish. How can he publish about our, what we are doing, what we are saying, etc., etc. And the Supreme Court laid down the law that ordinarily, okay, what I do in my bedroom or what I do in my house is my concern. Okay? And people cannot write about it without my consent. Hmm. But otherwise, otherwise the press has the full freedom to write what they want. Okay? With the exception of women who are subjected to rape, molestation, their names cannot be published. Okay? That's one aspect. Second thing is, while you cannot write anything about what is happening in my bedroom, etc., okay, once something becomes part of public record, whether it's a court case, whether it's something, uh, some other public record, then you cannot be prevented from writing about it. Okay? Whether it deals with uh, uh, private matters or non-private matters. Yeah. So suppose a matrimonial case is going on in court. Till it reaches the court, you can't really write about the matrimonial disputes which are happening. But once it becomes, suppose an FIR is lodged, then it becomes an official public record. Suppose a case is filed, it becomes an official public record. Then you can write about it. Okay, I mean, broadly speaking. Even then you have to represent truthfully what is uh, uh, what the record says and all that. But then you are not prevented from writing about it. Hmm. There's a, a Supreme Court in the same judgment further says, but there is an exception. Okay. The exception being, as far as public servants go, government officials, okay. government officials, if they have done something connected to the discharge of their duty or related to the discharge of their duty. Related means if you take money, it's related to the discharge. It's not necessarily connected. It may be connected also okay, to the discharge of the duty. Then they cannot sue anybody for defamation if somebody writes about it. Okay? They cannot prevent publication if somebody writes about it. Okay? As long as it's fair and accurate, etc., etc. So broadly speaking, the newspapers are given quite a broad mandate to write. Two or three things which they have to be careful about is if you are writing about an issue, if you are making allegation against a person, okay, you also should try to take that person's uh, opinion. As to where, I mean, this is the allegation against you. What do you have anything? You will see it in, in normal newspaper articles. People, uh, it is written that we tried to connect the person, but he refused to respond. Full stop. You know that that, that kind of thing happens. So that is one thing which you have to do. That you try to uh, connect the other, uh, try to contact the other person and see if that person has anything, any view on this, and then also publish those views. Okay? But broadly speaking, freedom of speech is quite quite broad. The court also says that there cannot be a pre-censorship on media. Yeah. See, on films there is pre-censorship. That is, a film before it is published, before it is shown, has to undergo censorship process. Yeah. Uh, that was challenged in uh, K. Abbas's case and some other cases. That how can you have pre-censorship? Whether uh, whether the court made distinction between say newspapers and uh, films. Uh, and basically said that films can be censored. Similarly, uh, theatre, the script has to be censored, passed through the censor, uh, it has to be approved, and only then you can publish, a, or you can perform a play in public, etc., etc. But for press and for other writings, okay, there is no pre-censorship, just like on internet, okay? There is no pre-censorship. Okay? You have a lot of cases which are uh, filed, say, and nowadays it happens very often in courts, where which are filed against, say, Google or Facebook or uh, uh, some of the others saying, take this down, this is defaming, why are you not, uh, why are you not doing this, etc., etc. And those battles are going on. Okay? And so what is the responsibility of the platforms uh, which, are on, uh, which are on the internet? 
what is it i mean can youtube censor what it is uh, putting up can facebook remove something okay or is it violating uh, freedom of speech and expression so these issues yeah, are uh, uh, still being debated in courts many times the courts have been granting injunction many many times uh, we have seen facebook or google and all will say come and say that yes this is something offending we are taking it off okay so this things happen okay the other aspect which i just wanted to mention about uh, defamation is the civil defamation and use of it or misuse of it for again bringing about a chilling effect on persons who are critical of a b or c things a lot of this happens uh, i i've seen at least my experience is that a lot of it happens in uh, terms of many big corporate houses okay going to courts and seeking injunctions okay against uh, articles which may be critical of them and uh, unfortunately the bombay high court okay, is somebody which is very very eager to grant injunctions so even if anything happens anywhere in the country okay, except for uh, gautam's uh, uh, <laughs> judgment uh, generally anything happens anywhere okay people come to bombay high court and file a case here because the likelihood of getting an injunction against publication is much higher in bombay high court than anywhere else the reason is very simple you see there is a british law which india follows because tort law civil law is the tort law which is not a legislated law it is a common law which you have been following since uh, uh, british times yeah. and so you basically get inspired by the british acts what is happening in british courts etc so british courts have said very clearly that if an article is defamatory and somebody comes to court saying grant an injunction against this person from publishing that article okay and if the person who has written that article says that i'll justify what i am saying in this article okay i'll justify what i am writing in this article then no injunction can be granted okay justification is a complete defense to a plea of injunction in uh, uh, this thing uh, british courts Yeah, you can always claim damages. Ultimately, if you win, you will get your damages. You you lose, you don't get damages, etc., etc. Case goes on, but injunction stopping you immediately. Okay, that is that doesn't happen. This is the law followed by all courts in India except Bombay High Court. Okay? <laughs> like for instance, in Delhi High Court, there was a case filed by uh, Tata's against uh, Green uh, Greenpeace. Uh, who were talking about uh, uh, some plant of tatas affecting ridley turtles turtles orissa beach somewhere and for that there was there used to be those of who whom uh, you who are of my age who remember there used to be a game called pacman on a computer which uh, some uh, small animal goes and eats up everything okay so they showed tatas is that pacman going and eating up ridley turtles kind of that was a game which they uh, software game which they came out with okay now now they went to delhi high court and and uh, uh, greenpeace said we'll we'll uh, we'll prove that what we are saying about their plant affecting ridley turtles is something which uh, uh, what we are saying is correct we'll justify our allegation that their plant because of the effluent which comes out etc etc is causing ridley uh, ridley turtles to die okay so once that was done once they said justification delhi high court said sorry no injunction we are not giving you injunction if you win you will get your damages otherwise forget about it okay but as i said that in bombay high court the situation is quite different so you will see every second day in bombay high court nowadays applications being made for injunction even against things which are not published uh i do represent times in a few cases so i know because uh, you get this uh, defamation cases against times of india or many of the newspapers saying that uh, you are uh, you know injunct uh, this article from being published or now with web pages 
I mean, everything goes on the web. So it's also that you take off the uh, thing from the, from the. So this is very, very uh, this thing. Uh, there is another organization called Crop Care Foundation. Now, this Crop Care Foundation is supposed to represent the fertilizer lobby. Okay. Uh, this foundation has a habit of finding of uh, fighting either itself or through United Phosphorus Company. Okay, cases against anybody who does even a mild criticism. If I say fertilizers, well, they may be harmful, then they'll file a case against me for hundred crores in Walsad Court or somewhere else. Okay. <laughs> now this is something which is very regularly happening. Okay, they file cases. Finally, one of the cases went to Supreme Court and Supreme Court said that this is rubbish. This, you can't file cases. Somebody is criticizing. Somebody doesn't agree that fertilizer should be used. Somebody feels that organic farming should be used. Okay? Or less fertilizer should be used. You can't sue them for defamation. Okay? This, is a, this is a debate which should go on. Okay? You can't uh, uh, sue people for defamation. Because the whole idea is you harass people so much. See, there, is, there are these the, the small NGOs, etc., which work on issues. Okay? Now, if you work on those issues, okay, somebody will come and uh, file a case against you, a big corporate, makes you run around. Finally, you will say, Jane, no, there are many other issues. Let's take up some other issue. It's okay, and you stop talking about it. But the essential thing is it has a chilling effect on the kind of uh, 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 you know things you want to do. So that's one aspect. The second aspect is that as far as uh, even uh, activists are concerned, the courts have consistently held that when you are talking about, you see, you use in a lot of places, you know, words like so and so Murdabad, so and so this, so and so that, you know, that doesn't, Murdabad means basically death to somebody. Okay? Now people sue saying, hey, bol hai, ko mar dalo. Huh? Murdabad bola. Huh? So, uh, defamation. Huh? Naam badnaam kya ho gere, whatever. The courts have said that in uh, uh, activists, organizations which are based on campaigns, etc., okay, some amount of embellishment, some amount of, uh, you know, pejorative uh, uh, writing or speaking, okay, it doesn't become an incitement. It doesn't become. It's it's a part of a culture of uh, you know organi organizations talking. This the same thing had happened to McDonald's in UK. For instance, in in UK, uh, there are some group of people who are saying that Mac burgers are harmful to health, and they were distributing uh, this thing, circulars, etc., etc., pamphlets. They were taken all the way up to European court. Okay. Saying that this is harmful, etc., etc. How can they say it's harmful, etc.? Where is the scientific certainty that it's harmful, etc.? It's like saying, where is the scientific certainty, you know, the certainty that tobacco causes cancer? Because nobody yet knows what causes cancer. So how can you say tobacco causes cancer? You know that 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 kind of a uh, that kind of a debate. Okay. So, but the courts have basically said no, that you can't stop this kind of uh, debates and this kind of opinions to be expressed. Okay. So. B broadly speaking, as far as defamation is concerned, uh, two or three things which we have to be clear about is that as long as one is talking broadly by doing, uh, it's not, I mean, you can't uh, keep on abusing people. Okay? But if you're analyzing a situation, you're talking about a situation on the, and that Justice uh, Gautam Patel's judgment in uh, uh, Money Life's case is an excellent example of how, uh, I mean, how, what the law is and how it should be interpreted, more so. Yeah. Uh, because, uh, I mean, uh, you will we'll be talking a bit about it? Huh. Okay. So I will not uh, talk about it, but, but it's an exa excellent example of that. No, we will talk on the judgment. Huh. I'll be talking about only the cases that I refer to, which is Reynolds and all those. Okay, okay. Reynolds versus, uh, Reynolds versus Fletcher and all that. Okay. Okay. Huh. Okay. See, basi basically, uh, as Justice Patel himself says in his judgment time and again, it's too technical for a judicial mind to understand what you have written, okay? Uh, in the sense that uh, it it was about uh, a certain insight, um, in a very simple language, uh, it was about certain insider trading of certain kind. 
what is it called loco uh, yes i think you better only talk about it because i <laughs> i am getting uh, so uh, justice patel basically said that look i mean they have uh, the, uh, actually uh, money life at the uh, uh, both of them had the plea of justification they said that we are justified in doing what we uh, writing what we wrote now the uh, now the court goes into it okay court goes into it uh, the judge goes into it finds that they were justified in saying what uh, what, what they said and also finds that uh, it's not uh, this thing what do you call it uh, uh, as far as the as far as the plaintiffs were concerned in that case uh, stock exchange okay? national stock exchange okay? they were maliciously uh, uh, coming after them and directed them to pay 50 lakh rupees okay as damages the plaintiffs were directed to pay 50 lakh rupees as damages and finally they went in appeal but they withdrew finally uh, uh, everything was and they withdrew the case so they huh they paid they paid yeah so so yeah yeah it's a it's a great thing which happened i mean it, it's one of the best judgments you can find and credit to them for having pursued it pursued it on their own not through lawyers okay which is very which is something which is at least in court right hmm. so it was it is, it is an excellent uh, excellent judgment which shows that if you follow the normal principles of journalism ethical ethical journalism okay uh, which is studying what you are writing doing some research on what you are writing trying to find out what the other side is opinion is doesn't give the opinion fine you can't help it and then reporting it okay? even if a case is filed against you the chances of that person succeeding are very bleak that's the point that as long as you are on sure footing okay? yes there can be some harassment there can be some uh, uh, some irritation etc etc but as long as you are on sure footing i don't think one should worry too much about defamation provided one is on sure footing and one doesn't use abuses one uses uh, um, a temperate language okay in writing what one writes then uh, uh, while it is an irritant while it can be but that irritation part can be taken care of like it has been taken care of when 10 cases or 20 cases were filed by courts granting injunction etc so that is something which we need to keep in mind i just wanted to go to the second issue that is the contempt of court uh, just yeah 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 sure so so as i understand yeah. a criminal defamation can be only against a person uh, not an, an organization no organization can criminal defamation but yeah i'll come to that okay okay i'll explain okay to you. Uh, but uh. civil defamation can be against an organization no you are talking also. about against or by against no by huh. sir by. by you are talking about yeah, by by, by. Huh. Huh. Uh, no see criminal defamation in fact uh, the section 499 of section 500 itself 499 itself says that criminal defamation can be even by an organization okay, okay? but that has to be some kind of a registered organization it, it, so, so a company can say I have been defamed okay? okay but Swadhyay Parivar okay. is to lose a body okay 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 but they can't say we have been defamed fine okay? understood there has to be some legal entity which can say that I have been defamed right right okay but uh, not some loose body of people who say that we follow this and we follow that kind of thing clear okay? that that's all yeah mm -hmm. thank you uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about contempt a little bit see contempt basically is again of two kinds civil and criminal what most of us here would be concerned with is criminal contempt and the reason is this that civil contempt is essentially if an say an order is passed against a person x and that person x violates that order an injunction is passed against you saying you can't enter this premises and you still enter the premises 
then you have uh, by violating a specific order of court you are committing contempt uh, uh, an order directed at you okay you are committing contempt of court if you violate that order after having known that such an order is passed okay so that civil contempt which you may face only if you are already in a litigation and some orders are passed against you and you violate that order that's what civil contempt is but unlike what the term suggests the punishment for civil contempt is criminal okay so you go to jail if the court wants you to go to jail okay otherwise no but the point is that uh, uh, the, uh, the, though it's called civil contempt okay the punishment is still criminal under the criminal law okay the criminal contempt <laughs> is basically abuse of the process of law court you know you have read about uh, two days back that one lawyer okay uh, was punished for criminal contempt by the supreme court by saying that for one year you were, you are debarred from coming here uh, okay that's under the powers of criminal uh, criminal contempt now criminal contempt can arise in various kind of situations like the first instance i remember in my personal life as a professional okay was i was a new young lawyer i was arguing before a judge justice uh, arvind savant okay who was also before that the advocate general and all okay? and i was arguing and suddenly i see something going past me and past the judge and hit the wall and it was a uh, sandal uh, okay and first thing i wanted to say was no i have not done it i have you know that kind of thing <laughs> not my client okay it was somebody else who felt aggrieved by some order okay of the court okay and threw a sandal at the judge okay now that amounts to criminal contempt that you are abusing the process of no courts okay you are basically sullying the clean wet waters of justice as they call it etc etc i mean one need not get too much carried away by that but uh, that's what uh, contempt is okay uh, that is what contempt uh, criminal contempt is now two things you must remember first and this is something which i get asked even by journalists most of the journalists know about it but i'll still say it that uh, there is no contempt if you even stridently criticize the judgment of even the supreme court full bench okay let me be very clear if you say that supreme court was wrong in giving this judgment and wrong for a b c d reasons it does not amount to contempt of court okay civil criminal whatever okay you are free to say that and in fact uh, yesterday only uh, i was arguing a matter before the division bench here in bombay high court and we were discussing a supreme court judgment whether it applies or doesn't apply so i told the judge this is the only thing in which the bar is in a better position than the bench because we can criticize the supreme court judgment you cannot <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know so anybody can criticize a supreme court judgment on merits hmm. that it is a wrong judgment say say yesterday there was a discussion on aadhar there is a judgment on aadhar okay so you can criticize saying that it's a wrong judgment and you see these criticisms coming repeatedly on uh, even in media say triple talaq judgment various other judgments which which are very hot sabri mala judgment various uh, 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 sensitive matters okay you can criticize it no, no matter how uh, you know stridently you want to criticize you can do that but you can't criticize the motives of a judge that amounts to contempt okay you can't say the judgment was given by this person because he took money and remember even if you have proof that he took money you can't do that okay even that amounts to contempt okay now th this is uh, something which you have to uh, bear in mind okay so criticize the judgment if you don't want to commit there are some people who will say i don't doesn't matter i'll commit come contempt but i'll say this okay but by and large criticize the judgment criticize the conduct no problems that doesn't amount to contempt but criticizing the motives of a judge 
or or or, or attributing certain reasons why a judgment was given which are not on merits but on something else okay that it, uh, it may not be corruption it may be caste it may be communalism it may be any issue okay but attributing to a judge motives okay will amount to contempt of court okay so that's something which now again the criminal contempt jurisdiction in a number of countries has been done away with okay many 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 countries say the criminal uh, judges don't need defense of contempt okay they can defend themselves otherwise you don't need to defend yourself so if somebody uh, somebody throws a uh, throws a chappal at me anyway it's an assault i can uh, that person can be prosecuted for assault you don't need criminal contempt power in order to uh, you know do this because criminal contempt a lot of people say uh, can tend to be abused can tend to be very very can tend to chill because uh, if even if i have proof if i am unable to show that unable to prove uh, unable to bring for uh, bring forth the proof about and uh, let us be clear because even supreme court judges have said that uh, that there is substantial corruption even within judiciary okay so that's a fact okay and if i am unable to bring that out if i am unable to talk about that in public okay, then uh i am mean, especially if i have proof etc and looking at which the uh, looking at the way in which the judiciary is constituted today namely they appoint themselves they transfer themselves they uh, they are not subject to right to information act they are not subject to various other laws etc etc so you have uh, you have uh, a complete uh, opacity in appointments in transfers complete non accountability on in various other ways okay so why should this why should this criminal contempt at all be there on the uh, uh, on the and especially if you have they amended the law okay they amended the law uh, the criminal contempt part um, uh, to mean that now you can't uh, you can't prosecute a person if he is able to prove that a judge is corrupt but that has been interpreted by delhi high court again to mean that no but you still can't criticize the motives of a judge so this is the interpretation that is now pending in the supreme court but so the, so the situation today as of now is that you cannot criticize the motives the biases etc etc of the judges that will amount to criminal contempt okay? and criminal contempt is what you have to be cautious about so when you write or when activists and uh, and activists of i mean you have you have seen arundhati roy being tried for criminal contempt prashant bhushan himself being tried for criminal contempt okay many times what happens is and this is how it works out in courts normally okay doesn't always work out normally what happens is that you make you write something you cast some aspersions or during the arguments you say something to the judge okay some lawyers who have uh, uh, very abrasive and can say something to the judge individually and then criminal case is filed criminal contempt is filed then the lawyer writes an affidavit saying i apologize unconditionally okay then that apology is accepted and the matter is put at put at rest this is how uh, the normal thing works out okay sometimes it doesn't like it doesn't didn't work out in justice kanan's case who was a judge of the chennai high court and then transferred to calcutta and who made very very strong allegations against uh, uh, supreme court judges some of which i personally don't think i i think he went much overboard than uh, what he could have done what what he should have done but uh, but anyway so and then he was punished for contempt put behind bars for 6 months as uh, you know he was the first sitting judge to be put behind bars uh, for 6 months so uh, or sitting or retired i guess to be put behind bars for 6 months for our contempt similarly uh, day before yesterday you had a lawyer who was you see the powers of supreme court are quite wide so while the contempt of court may prescribe a particular punishment the court may not give that punishment court may do something else like they did with this particular lawyer they said that uh, we are punishing you for contempt but uh, what we are doing is the punishment will be you won't be able to practice for one year in Bom in uh, supreme court and uh we are sentencing you for 3 months imprisonment 
but that's a suspended sentence and that suspend that that sentence will uh, trigger out only when uh, if you continue to browbeat judges, the allegation was that he browbeats uh, judges in the courts. Okay, so if you continue to browbeat, then you will be put into. Uh, but if you behave yourself, you won't be put put behind. Right? So that's the kind of uh, uh, judgment. So in contempt, this is the basic thing which you have to be, and certain other things which may amount to contempt, like publishing the name of a woman victim of rape, okay, in newspapers, okay, may be treated as contempt. Because these are there are specific laws which say you can't do that. Okay, so these are the kind of things which you have to, one. I mean, as activists also, uh, one has to be cautious about. Okay, and as journalists, that uh, you don't uh, get into uh, personal vilification. You criticize the con you criticize the judgment. You criticize say conduct. That's why there is a demand now that every everything which happens in court should be videographed or should be telecast or whatever you know. The, like, if it's in, because we we are in a like there was the, uh, this one case which we handled. Uh, there is this uh, famous case of uh, Surabuddin, which was going on, which was transferred from Gujarat to Bombay, and uh, it was going on in Sessions Court. And then uh, one fine day, the judge said that the media will not be allowed inside. Uh, media will not, cannot write about it at all. Okay, there was a complete gag on the media. And then uh, we had taken it to the High Court. And the High Court removed that gag, right? right. But basically saying that, look, in India, the trials are supposed to be open trials. Okay? That is, anybody can come in and anybody can report about it. What is happening? The whole idea of a democracy is not to have secret trials. Okay? Let people know what is happening in, in all institutions, including courts. That's the whole fulcrum of democracy. So you can't prevent media unless there are certain very, very uh, uh, sensitive issues for very, like for instance, uh, this case of uh, Baj Hakre's will was going on in court. And Jaidev Thakre came and uh, wanted to say that, uh, wanted to make some personal allegations basically. Okay? And he wanted to lead evidence for that. So then the judge said that this can lead to kind of law and order situation. You better say it in the camera. Huh? Gautam Patel again. Yeah. So that is a specific kind of a situation where the courts do have powers to conduct in camera trials. But if it's not an in-camera trial, and you can't generally c conduct in-camera trials, okay? sometimes in matrimonial disputes you have in-camera trials, uh, po poxo cases about children uh, uh, being sexually molested, etc. You have in-camera trials; their names can't be revealed and all that. But otherwise, trials are open trials where media is allowed. Media can write about what is happening in the trials, what is happening in court, and there cannot be a restriction on the media. And so if you write something which is happening in court, it cannot amount to contempt. At the same time they say, and this is something which is, you see, it can swing either ways in the sense that at the same time they say that media trials are to be avoided. Yeah. Namely, you can't uh, have a trial, you can't have somebody convicted by the media before that person is even tried. Okay. Uh, many times, many times it happens that uh, uh, somebody is placed before the media. Okay, is they confess kiya hai, crime? Okay, before even the trial begins. Okay, now those kind of things are not because ultimately whether you are guilty or not is to be decided by the courts. And so those kind of things are treated as contempt sometimes, criminal contempt. Okay? That you try and, uh, you know, uh, prove, uh, normally the criminal contempt is not filed in these cases, but sometimes there, there are a few examples of them being filed. Otherwise, what you have is that the courts keep, on the one hand, the courts say that media trials should not be conducted because media is convicting somebody and judges are also human beings, they get affected. They watch. There was a judge in the U.S. Supreme Court in the 20s who said the day I became the judge, 
I stopped reading media. I stopped talking to my wife about anything outside the house because I should not be affected by what is happening elsewhere. But I mean, but obviously you can't expect judges to be like that. I mean, they watch the TVs, they watch the, uh, they read the newspaper, etc. So that's one thing that you uh, that uh, ultimately it indirectly influences judges. On the other end, they say many times that no, uh, judiciary is we are too strong to get influenced by these uh, these media things. So it doesn't really worry us, you know. So so you have both kinds of arguments going both and judgments reflecting both kinds of arguments in court but essentially okay a media trial can be construed at times and has been construed at, at times by the by the courts as bordering on contempt so that is the other thing which one has to uh, be a little cautious about though much much more is about uh, uh, I mean criminal contempt is used much more for conduct of people against individual judges okay that's what happens that against individual judges either inside the courtroom or outside okay that criminal contempt is used so basically making allegations saying that 50 percent of the judges in India are corrupt will not amount to either contempt or defamation but saying that this particular judge is corrupt will amount to criminal contempt okay so one has to be cautious about that okay that's all thank you very much i think i'll stop there asked to just present what we did Oops. in case of yeah i'll do that what we did in our particular case so we can only talk of what the processes we followed uh, and uh, the case laws that we refer to. Uh, we were helped in this by none other than Subramaniam Swami, who has this great record of having won. He says every single uh, uh, defamation case that he has filed and nothing is, and not, and not having lost any. So uh, he, while going to the airport, I, mean, I was mailing him and he was replying to me. So I, I asked him which are the case laws because we were tried, we had to prepare it for ourselves. We didn't have lawyers in the first round, which is when it was actually heard and when the judgment was delivered. It's only in the division bench that we had the uh, benefit of uh, having, you know, good lawyers for us. By which time, of course, the judgment had come, and you know, most of the case was won. There was no injunction against us, and we could write, and and so on. Everything was over in a matter of uh, six weeks. I think the first uh, notice of motion came up on 24th uh, July, and 9th September was this great Gautam Patel's judgment, which actually uh, was a big talk of the legal circles in high court. Large number of them hated this judgment because uh, who is this, uh, you know, two, three people coming in and make standing there and making some arguments and Gautam Patel giving this brilliant judgment which can be now quoted everywhere because I've, finally that's what stands because the, uh, they withdrew the case. So, um, <clears throat> This is uh, if, uh, one of the first things that we cited, and uh, um, the key thing here is that the investigation was being pursued with diligence. In fact, there's no evidence that had not been there had been any investigation. So his writing in this particular case was entirely in public interest. That's one of the points that uh, Mr. Desai has made. So the first criteria is that are you writing with an agenda? Are you writing for the public? It's supposed, is it supposed to benefit the l large number of people? This is one of the first things that the courts are going to decide. In fact, I will mention later that these things can't be attached post facto. You can't write anything and then go and sort of argue that it is in public interest. Your work itself should be done in a manner that you're doing uh, more public interest and, and not the other way around. Uh, this is this was one of the most cornerstone judgments on, in 1994, which is R. Rajgopal versus State of Tamil Nadu, Justice Jeevan Reddy of the Supreme Court. The most crucial thing in this is that in such a case, it would be enough for the defendant, that is a member of the press or media, to prove that he acted after reasonable verification of the fact, it is not necessary for him to prove what the, what he's written is true. So most of, most of, everybody will tell you, truth is your strongest defense. 
you have to say you have to stand up and say that yes i know what i have written it's it's a fact but in this particular case in case of public officials where you're writing about something which involves public officials this was the this is a very very important thing that was uh, that was held and he acted after a reasonable verification of the facts so once again it is in the process of the work that you do in the principles of journalism that you follow that you are through which you are able to fight and these things can't be done post facto reynolds versus times uh, by times newspaper two most important things and i am going to elaborate on this uh, in the subsequent sli slide once again it was in public interest that the information should be published and the publisher has acted responsibly in doing so now <clears throat> everybody is going to ask what is public interest of course that's why the courts are there you have to prove and uh, through long processes of work and judgments etc it's been very very fairly established what is in public interest and uh, you know what is not acted responsibly fortunately in my next slide is a very very clear articulation of what is responsible journalism and this for this we refer to lord nichols of birkenhead and these are the factors that he says about 10 factors which which is the real test of whether the newspaper or the publisher has acted responsibly or not the seriousness of the allegation we know it's not something frivolous and not something small once again if it's in larger public interest it's serious enough the nature of the information and the extent to which the subject matter of public concern the source of the information some in, some informants have no direct knowledge some people have their own access to grind so who is your source what where have you sourced it from have you verified it have you checked it and so on the steps taken once again a process in while doing why before writing what have, what did you do what are the steps that you took to verify the information the status of the information allegations may have already been the subject of an investigation which is very very important all of these things are very important in our particular case already virappa moili was asking for an investigation into the algo scam of nsc right the urgency of the matter news is often a perishable commodity therefore i had to write i couldn't wait for x y z and so on and so forth otherwise the news would be stale when a comment was sought from the other side this is absolutely the corner to you just cannot go out and write whatever you want to without giving a reasonable opportunity to the other side to defend their case to defend their position where the article contained the gist of the other side and having asked you have to incorporate that the tone of the article whether it's reasonable whether it's shrill whether it entices people to do something wrong no the circumstances of the publication including the timing why we why are you writing now now if you just go back to each one of these um the our particular case when we stood there and argued we we can check box in each of these it was serious it was in public interest we had taken enough of steps to verify we had asked the other side not once but thrice and we could produce the smss that suchada had sent to them and the fact that the tone of the article was not we didn't allege any wrongdoing we said there should be an investigation in fact the that's that's the main point that nichols bogan had says that can raise call, call for an investigation it need not adopt allegations or statements of fact we didn't do that and the circumstances including the timing because you know we waited we asked and if we did not publish nobody else was writing we were the first and so on and so forth now <clears throat> I want to make a make a very very specific point here, and that is that I am not aware of any publication. I have worked in so many of them. I have worked in Business India, Business World, Financial Express, Times of India, and Business Today, where where I did the first cover story. We launched the publication, and a couple of them which uh, are defunct now also. So I do not remember. Till the time I was journalist, which is ninety four, eighty uh, four to ninety four, a full time journalist, I do not remember a single case in any of these publications where these things were told to me, either before I joined, during I joined, or whenever I did a story, right? So the publications themselves make themselves vulnerable by not following these well articulated, clearly laid out steps and incorporating it in their processes. now this is a essential flaw of journalism at least the way it's practiced in india today that first of all people who are not trained or qualified they come into this 
So, you know, it will be extraordinary to find a civil engineer, who, uh, somebody who's not a civil engineer to be building bridges, but here there are people who possibly have no training or not been trained in-house, out-house, wherever, to, they're sent out, in the, on, uh, out there and to write a story and there are probably no checks and balances and they, they themselves become very, very vulnerable. I also want to point out that in our case, in our specific case, uh, not only was that this article was written by Sucheta, who had a formal training in journalism, but I have noticed in my 30 years that in all of these things, whether she's aware of this or not, all these are incorporated in every article that she writes. So it's part of her process. And that's that's what makes her one of the best in the country. Law. Oh, you have studied law as well. Well, it becomes a part of her process. It's it's part, part of her blood. So it's it's if your work process is strong enough and you followed all of these things, you have nothing to worry about. You can always count on somebody like me to decide to defend you when he sees the facts of the case and he says, yes, you've done all the right things and you have a case here. If you don't have a case here, then, of course, that's another matter. Uh, this is a very, very famous case, which is New York Times versus Sullivan. Doesn't fully apply over here, but this is how you know, advanced countries, well-developed countries, see their press and the kind of the freedom that they gives in. So he, it says, it's, uh, the judge, it's a little roundabout way of saying it, but he says that if you compel the, the press when they are writing about public officials, or when they're writing about public figures, to guarantee the truth, that yes, you cannot write unless you guarantee the truth, that means self-censorship. You cannot have that kind of a situation. So, so the courts have recognized the difficulties of adducing legal proofs, proofs that will pass under the strict eyes of the, uh, uh, the judge. And under such a rule, would-be critics of official conduct may be deterred from voicing the criticism. All right? So you cannot have a law, you cannot have a system where public officials cannot be criticized because you cannot bring the strictest possible legal proof to the court. So you have to have that level of freedom. This is how uh, it was held. It's a really a landmark case, New York Times versus Sullivan. Uh, these are the two slides which are related, or which uh, now this is a new thing that's come and Mr. Desai would know all about this. This is not my domain, but uh, Suchada mentioned that this should be part of this thing. So this is a very peculiar new thing that has come up, which is strategic lawsuit against public participation mainly aimed at NGOs. All right. So it, this is nothing other than a lawsuit that is intended to censor, intimidate, and silence critics by burdening them with the cost of illegal defense. In a slab suit, the plaintiff does not expect to win. Their goals accomplished if the defendant succumbs to fear, intimidation, mounting legal costs, or simple exhaustion, and abandons the criticism. Okay? In some cases, repeat, repeated frivolous litigation against a defendant may impose financial costs, and so on. A slab may also, it's a message to the rest of them, that don't go after us, this is what we are going to do to, to you. Now, the most extraordinary thing is uh, what uh, um, Professor Sridhar Acharyulu, who was the uh, one of the chief, uh, one of the election commission, uh, sorry, um, information commissioners, and he said that CIC itself and the citizens are a target of slaps. Unfortunately, the government bodies. They themselves are doing this, slapping writ petitions right, left, and center against respondent one, which is the CIC, and number two, the citizen who are asking for information is empowered by RTI. Government officers want, want their rights to be protected from the Information Commission as per the will of the Parliament of India, which means that the government itself is a major initiator, according to Professor Achirulu, of slap suits. So I, this is just. Oh boy, 1,700 writ petitions, yes. So uh, this is a short thing that I wanted to share with you and how we went about, what cases we relied on. And once again, I conclude by saying you cannot write what you want to and then look for case laws to defend you. Your processes have to rely on what is legally tenable and that is very clear, a little bit of Googling can tell you what is the framework in which you work and if you incorporate that in your work process, you have nothing to fear. Thank you very much.